All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the Hub International Critical Crashes, preparing for the unexpected webinar. Our presenters today are Steve Bojan, he's a VP of Fleet Risk Services at Hub International Limited. Uh, myself, Jack Shell, Vice President, Hub International Transportation, and Mike Bassett, Transportation Attorney and Owner of the Bassett Firm. Uh, during the live webinar, all lines will be muted until the end, then we will open it up for questions. You may also submit any questions electronically to christine.jacobs at hubinternational.com. Uh, I'm going to start off with the first couple of slides. I'm not really going to read them verbatim, but uh, I will make some uh, some uh, strategic points that I want to express. Uh, first one is from the insurance perspective. Basically, the truck accident attorneys um, are getting very sophisticated. Uh, plaintiffs also often look at these uh, claims as a way to retire. Instead of just getting your car fixed and your medical bills paid, they want to retire. So the verdicts are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, one thing I wanted to note is like the million dollar uh, verdict is no longer a shock loss. Our, our average claims are three to four million. Um, the medical side of it is, is getting, it's escalating uh, car crash situations. Medical costs are not managed. Uh, and then also the medical care after the accident is not discounted. So these are areas where the legal environment, I personally feel the legal environment in the last five years has pretty much changed drastically in Texas. Um, we used to see uh, these nuclear verdicts maybe once every two to three years, and now we're seeing three to four in like a recent 12 month period. A couple of the recent verdicts, we have $101 million uh, verdict here in Texas and another $260 million verdict in Texas. Uh, out of these two that are posted, I want you to, under the $101 million, the driver signed off on training that he never received. And then on the $260 million verdict, the truck driver had been driving for 17 hours. This is where these guys are going. They're looking and digging deep and deep to find one little thing that they can hang their hat on. In the end, it's your money. The insurance carriers are not in the business to lose money. So these large outstanding reserves, uh, these large shock losses, they eventually catch up to you. The insurance world is gonna get their money back out of you. You're, you will see rate increases, um, and not just from your current carrier, more than likely you leave your current carrier, and then the second carrier is gonna look, and these, these uh, shock losses will follow you, and you'll continually to get the rate increases. And it's not just the liability, the environmental cleanups are getting out of control. The towing costs are, are increasing as well. And then afterwards, you have this on your loss run, and these things will follow you for at least five years. So going into this, you need to have a plan to deal with the critical crashes. The worst time to put one of these things together is the day one happens. So everyone thinks that they are prepared to handle these types, but at the end of the day, we're probably not. No one is bulletproof. So remember, everything is potentially discovered. So think about everything that you write down. As you will see in Mike's presentation, potentially everything is discoverable. It, it's a great presentation and you'll see what we're talking about there. And then do you wanna document everything? That's a good question. So you need to get the ball rolling as soon as possible. One of the worst things you can do in the event of a critical crash is to not call your insurance company immediately. I mean, ASAP. And the second thing is, yes, invest in the attorney and call the attorney ASAP. It's not the time to go cheap on these uh, claims. I'll turn it over to Mike. Now, Mike. Thank you very much, Jack. So I'm going to pick up on a few threads that Jack said, and that is that trucking companies have always been a target. Now they are a bigger target. So here's a little backstory about how I end up doing my presentation. There is a law firm out of Kansas City called Dollar and Burns, and they sue trucking companies, and I've defended trucking companies over the years that they have sued, and I got to know those lawyers very well. They're probably some of the best trucking lawyers in the country. And they called me, and they said, we have a case down in Dallas. Can you be our local counsel? It involves multiple tractor trailers. And I looked, and believe it or not, I cleared conflicts, so I was able to help them with this case. The case was tried in July, or excuse me, November of 2017, 
and I was fortunate enough to be on the trial team. And on about the eighth or ninth day of trial, as I was listening to the testimony, I thought, you know what? I need to sit and make a list of the things I am learning again, sitting on the plaintiff's side of a trucking case to share with the trucking companies and insurance carriers that I represent. And that is where this presentation comes from. So here's what I'm going to do in my time with you. I'm going to set the stage about how the accident happened that ultimately got tried. The first lesson I will visit with you guys about is this, follow your own policies. Follow your own policies. Lesson number two, it's great to have policies, but be careful what your policies say. I suspect that some people on this call who are working for trucking companies are very proud of the fact that they have a notebook that has a bunch of policies in it, and you should be proud. What I suspect, though, is that some of you don't know exactly what's in those policies. And if they are your policies, you own them. You cannot escape them. So it's probably a good idea to read what your policies say. Lesson number three, and perhaps the most important lesson, your company's fate often depends on your driver. You hire your own problems is what a trucking company uh, person told me years and years ago, and that is true. I don't care how good your safety is. I don't care how slick your safety person is. I don't care how shiny your trucks are. If your driver implodes on the stand, your trucking company is going down with them. Lesson number four, the standard of care. Plaintiff's lawyers are gonna do all they can to have the jury hold your trucking company and your driver to a higher standard of care than the plaintiff. And it's very easy to do based upon the federal motor carrier safety regulations. Lesson number five, don't assume the police are correct. Many of you may have cases sitting on your desk right now where you've got a police report that puts fault on the claimant and no fault on your driver, and you've breathed a sigh of relief. Not so fast. Likewise, some of you may have claims sitting on your desk where the investigating police officer puts it all on your driver. Not to worry. The police may have gotten it wrong. The last lesson I'll visit with you about is that money spent on the defense of the case pays off in spades. And I will show you what it looked like from the plaintiff's side, how money spent resulted in a return that was exponentially higher than the money spent. And then I'll end with some takeaways. So let's set the stage of this accident. It happens November 22, 2013, and this is I-40 near Vega, Texas, up in the Texas Panhandle, and if you were looking for the flattest place in the United States, it would probably be here. I-40 goes east and west, two lanes, divided by a grassy median. The accident happened going eastbound, and that would be from the bottom of the picture going to the horizon. Vega is outside of Amarillo to the west of Amarillo. This is the driver for Prime Inc., the defendant, the only trucking defendant that was, uh, that our folks sued. She was the driver. She was not at trial. She was deposed before trial and a decision was made not to bring her to trial. So all the jury heard from this driver was her videotaped deposition testimony, some of which you will hear today. This was her co-driver, Aaron Ellison. He was not at trial either. All the jury heard was his deposition testimony. This is Steve Field, the safety supervisor for Prime, and he was at trial and he testified as the corporate representative. I give you these photographs because you're gonna watch video clips from these people, and I want you to know who they are. These were our clients. They were in a van. The patriarch of the family was driving was Guillermo Vasquez, and behind him was his wife, Belinda Vasquez. They had been married going on 55 years, I believe. They had three adult children. 
Their one adult child, William, was in the front seat. Their adult daughter, Alma, was in the back seat. Their third adult son was not in the van. Behind Alma was her husband, Hector. And next to Hector was one of Alma and Hector's two sons, Noah. Our clients were on the way to watch Alma and Hector's oldest son, Guillermo and Belinda's grandson, play in the state high school football championships in Amarillo. And for any of you who know Texas and know football, that is a big, big deal. Guillermo Vasquez was a retired coach from El Paso, was very well known, and was very excited to be go watching his grandson play in the state finals. So the accident happens eastbound on I-40. As she is going eastbound, the accident happens, I believe, about 10 o'clock at night. It's dark. You will hear Sarah Gregory testify. As she's going down the road, she sees brake lights in front of her in the distance. She hits her brakes and she jackknifes, and she covers both lanes of I-40. A Toyota Prius, driven by folks who were not at the trial, hit the trailer at about 56 miles an hour. There was a fatality in the Prius. Our folks in the white van come along, and we hit the prime trailer at about 10 miles an hour. The black box on our client's van showed that we had been going about 17 miles an hour. And then when Mr. Vasquez saw brake lights ahead of him, he put on his brakes, was able to steer and slid at about 10 miles an hour into the prime trailer. When the van hit the trailer, there were no serious injuries and everybody in the van was conscious and everybody was checking on themselves and each other to see if they were okay. Based upon the ECM download from the prime tractor, we know that eight minutes later, a tractor driven by p and Transport hit the back of the Chevy van. The p and tractor is, I, I'm colorblind, but I'm told that that's called Robin's Egg Blue. And that was very important because you're going to hear the trooper talk about paint transfer. This blue paint transfer was on the back of the prime trailer. So P&O comes along and hits the back of the Chevy van about eight minutes after the prime vehicle has come to a rest. And this is what it looked like from our reconstructionist. That's the P&O transport tractor hitting the van. The P&O transport tractor then goes left, hits the Prius as well, pushes everything down the road. Then a red tractor trailer belonging to a trucking company called DOD collides with the prime trailer and the P&O tractor, keeps going eastbound, keeps going eastbound, and that's how everything ends up. So I'm gonna go back through this just so you can see what it looks like in essentially stop motion. First impact, our client's impact, p and hits, in comes DOD, in comes DOD, DOD hits and everybody ends up essentially like this. The lower right hand corner, you'll see the long object over the fog line, that is our client's van. The Prius is the other vehicle that's in the roadway. And that's what it looked like out at the scene. And to orient you, eastbound is looking away from the camera. You can see the Prius and you can see the van and you can see the prime truck. There were multiple other tractor trailers involved in this accident, but they were all non-contact. They came up on the accident scene and were able to go left or right, either to the center median or the right median. And so there was no other contact with any vehicles. So that's what it looked like out at the scene. That is what our client's van looked like after the accident and after it was towed and, and put into a, a, an impound yard. So what were the damages? 
Guillermo Vasquez, as a result of the second aspect, lost his left leg below the knee. It had to be amputated. Belinda Vasquez, his wife behind him, died seven days later at a hospital in Amarillo from essentially blunt force trauma that they couldn't fix. William Vasquez, the front seat passenger, had a bump over his eye, which will tell you that some people do have guardian angels sitting on their shoulders. Alma Perales, sitting behind her brother, was thrown almost upside down inside the van and broke uh, the toes on her, a uh, couple of toes on each of her feet and also severely strained or fractured her left ankle. Noah, in the back, just had bumps and bruises. So you remember when I told you that our clients hit the back of the trailer going about 10 miles an hour, and there was probably five minutes where everybody sat there checking on each other to see if everybody was okay. Alma Perales testified that she had turned around and was talking to her husband to make sure that her husband and son were okay, and she saw headlights coming at them. That was the P&O transport truck that hit them at about 56 miles an hour. As a result of that impact, Hector was ejected out the back of the van and was killed. When Alma extricated herself and stumbled out of the back of the van onto the frozen road with no shoes and stepping on glass, the first thing she encountered was her husband laying dead on the road. So those were the damages to our client. So that sets the stage for the accidents. First and foremost, lesson one, follow your own policies. So this is testimony from Steve Fields, and he's talking about driver seat classifications, like sitting in a seat. At the time of the accident, Sarah Gregory and her co-driver, Aaron Ellison, were B, Bravo One drivers. And you'll hear what he has to say about driver designations. Listen to what he has to say. Okay. So what are what are the meaning of, of these dates? Those are the dates that we change her C class in the computer. Okay. So D means uh, completely new. Correct. B two uh, means trainee has gotten her license, but is still in a training status. B1, what does that mean? We used to have an intermediary or an intermediate step between B2 and AC. Was B1 considered a trainee? B1 would be someone that's not quite ready to go out on their own. We still use that C class. Uh, maybe we get an applicant in that has no flatbed experience, but wants to go to the flatbed division, we bring them out, bring them in as a B1, put them out with a flatbed trainer for several weeks, and then he would upgrade to AC. So the, the collisions occurred when Miss Gregory was a B1 driver. That is correct. So, how does Prime's safety director classify B1 drivers? Not quite ready to go out on their own. Both Sarah Gregory and Aaron Ellison were B1 drivers. Anybody on the call care to guess Prime's policy on whether two B1 drivers could operate a commercial motor vehicle? That's a rhetorical question. Prime's policy was that B1 drivers could not operate a commercial motor vehicle together. And I know you all can guess why Prime had that policy. Prime hide that policy because you don't want to put two rookies in a truck together in case they encounter something that's new and unknown. So this was a situation where Prime had to acknowledge that their own policies should have never allowed these two drivers to be in this tractor on the night of this accident. Lesson number two, not only do you need to know what your policies or be careful what your policies are, but you have to watch what your policies say. Everybody on this call, I hope, makes a note on their pad they're looking at 
that says, look at our policies tomorrow morning and see what they say regarding key facts. So this is the policy from Prime after an accident. And listen to what Ms. Gregory has to say. The number one thing you're supposed to do is stop and set out warning devices, true? True. And there's no qualification about safety at that point because they recognize the safe thing to do is to get those out there, correct? Sure. Anytime you're on the highway where you have an incident, shoulder, not shoulder, in the roadway, it can create a hazard, correct? Sure. For you or someone else, correct? Yeah, ways are accomplished, I guess. But particularly if you're out in the roadway, correct? Correct. And you did not do that. Instead, you abandoned your truck, correct? Yes, and I abandoned so, my truck. And so doing, you violated the standard of care that Prime wanted you to follow. True? Yes. Is that a yes? Yes. All right, so this clip serves up a couple of issues. One, we start to hear this standard of care language that the jury hears again and again. I'm going to give you a little preview. What happened after Sarah Gregory jackknifes and blocks I-40 is she gets out of the truck and runs to the other side of the freeway. She does not put out warning devices. She does not put out triangles. She does not put out flares. She does not activate the flashers on her trailer. She, in fact, has to go back because she realizes Aaron Ellison is not with her. So she goes back to the truck a second time to rouse him because he is in the sleeper and, again, puts out no warning devices whatsoever. So now you've got a company that has a good policy. This is a good policy. Secure the scene and calm down. I think those are great instructions for a driver. But then if you have those, you need to follow them. Lesson number three, your trucking company's fate often depends on your driver. I've been defending trucking companies in Texas for 32 years, and only once have I tried a lawsuit where the truck driver was still working for the company that they were driving for at the time of the accident. This business is such that most drivers, if they stick around two or three years, four years, that's a long time. Well, if you have an accident in January of 2016, a plaintiff's attorney waits a year to file a lawsuit. Now you're talking January 17. The case doesn't go to trial for two years. Now you're talking January 2019. Chances are that driver no longer works for your company. But a jury's not going to know that and a jury is gonna judge your company based on your driver. So, here's a little backstory. When Ms. Gregory went to work for Prime, she had a really interesting story that the jury never heard. She was working as a nurse's aide, and her husband was working, they had a couple kids, and her husband was injured and could not work and she needed to make more money. And she got online and found out that she could go work for Prime, even if you did not have a commercial driver's license, and they would train you, and she would be making good money. So that is why she went to work for Prime. Remember something I'm gonna tell you a little bit later, and that is when we are defending these cases, we have to have a story, ladies and gentlemen. We have to have a story. This was a good story, that she told in her deposition, but we didn't play it. But here's what she had to say about the accident and her experience. Um, this employment with Prime would have been your first employment as a truck driver for an 18-wheeler. Sure. And so your entire experience of driving one of these big rigs at the time that you started this trip from Santa Rosa and ultimately ended in this crash would have been a few months. Okay. So at the time of this wreck, from the time she started with Prime without a commercial driver's license where she was a D2 driver to the time of this accident was a couple of months. All right. So that's 
what we know about her on the day of the accident. This is a term, novice versus experience, that we used a lot. And here's what she has to say. Sitting here today, do you consider yourself an experienced truck driver or still a novice? Experienced. And what's changed between November 2013 and here today, which is, I guess, June of 2016? Many, many miles. So you agree that with many, many miles, you've become more experienced? Yes. And do you believe that you would have done things differently today as an experienced truck driver than you did back in November of 2013? Would you not have yes. been as panicked? Not as panicked, yes. Right, because you've now been through at least one of these type of situations, right? Correct. And with a reasonable driver like you would have done now as an experienced driver, you probably would have put on triangles or flares to identify that your vehicle was at least partly in the lane, right? Correct. That's what a reasonably prudent driver would do, correct? Correct. This played into our theme that she should have never been on the road that day because she was inexperienced. She was a novice. She was still driving at the time this deposition was taken in July of 2016, not for Prime, but for another company. But you can see how this testimony folded into the narrative that we had, and that was that this lady and this other driver should have never been on the road. They were put out there over their head, and it was a recipe for disaster. One of the things that I was thinking about when Jack was talking early on about gathering documents. Tractor trailers nowadays, tractors have probably more computers than the initial Mars landing craft. We need to get that information as fast as we can because it tells us a story. And we also needed to get it from the four-wheeler as well. But we pulled the ECM from the tractor and I think you can see on the screen that the speed is 58 miles an hour. You can look where the time is 12.07 a.m. That was the time where it was being recorded. The actual accident was, I think, at 10 or 11.07, but the two-hour difference is because of being in a different time zone. And if you look at the top where it says minus 33, that is 33 seconds before impact. Okay, so listen to what she has to say. I know what you guys are thinking, 58 miles an hour, how do you get a constant 58 miles an hour? Everybody's thinking it's because of your cruise control. Let's see what she has to say. You see that your speed recorded by the data is 58, correct? Yes. Um, what's the maximum your vehicle will travel? 62. So you were nearing the max maximum speed that your tractor trailer will drive, correct? Correct. Just before you lost control, correct? Correct. Now we can agree that if the testimony, if the evidence in this case turns out that there was precipitation at that time, this speed would be below the standard of care, true? True. Sure. Not only would it be a violation of the, your standard of care, it would be a gross violation of your standard of care. True. Okay. It would be dangerous. Correct? Correct. It would pose a threat of serious physical injury to other folks on the highway, including potentially my clients. Correct? Correct. And this isn't one of those situations where if all of that was true, you would just be going a little bit over. <laughs> you would have been grossly over the appropriate speed limit for an 18-wheeler if precipitation was present. Correct. If it was present, yes. It looks like every one of those entries are capturing your speed at nearly exactly 58 miles an hour. Yes. Are you telling the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that you were able to accomplish that feat without cruise control? Yes. How? Because on the pedal I can go that fast. Maybe my question wasn't clear. I'm asking how you were able to maintain a near perfectly constant speed of 58 without cruise control. Is 
straight away. Is that because you had the pedal completely pressed to the floor? Yes. I see. So you you had the accelerator pressed as far as you could get it to the floor, maxed out during that entire time? Yes. As fast as the doggone thing ago. There is no reason for me not to. So, observations about this little snippet of testimony. First, you start to hear this term gross violation. Gross violation. That is to get the jury thinking about punitive damages. Second, now you've got this term pedal to the metal out there. So she is going as fast as she can go. She testified that there was no ice and no precipitation leading up to the accident. That's why she said she could go as fast as it would go because her testimony was there was nothing wrong with the roadway. Testimony was contradicted by many other witnesses out there at the scene. We talked earlier about making sure you follow your policies and knowing what your policies say. Here's what she has to say about what she does after everything comes to rest. You then had to wake your co-driver. Correct. You then exited the vehicle to abandon the vehicle. Correct? Correct. Come back to the vehicle to try to arouse him. Correct? To get him out, yes. Once you get him out, then abandon the vehicle again. Correct. And you then never had any intent at that point to try to put any type of warning device out for your vehicle. I didn't feel it was safe. I understand. But you had no intent to do so. No. You recognized that you were the one that lost control. Recognize that once you lost control and had your trailer in the roadway, it created a hazard to other folks on the highway. Correct. It created a dangerous situation for folks on the highway. Correct. That put other drivers at risk of serious physical injury or death. Correct. A hazard that you had created. Correct? Sure. All right. One of the questions you may be thinking is, did this lady have a lawyer there with her? And the answer is yes. She had one of the best trucking defense lawyers in the state who, I understand, prepared her for three days. But sometimes you just get what you get when you put a witness up on the stand. This abandoning the vehicle was a theme that we started using, and she agreed with it. And you will hear later why that was so important that we had a jury think that she abandoned her vehicle. Because I know many of you on the call are thinking, well, wait a minute. When the van hit the prime truck, nobody was really hurt, and that accident was over. And then it was only when the P&O tractor ran into the back of the van at about 56 miles an hour that everybody was hurt. That's why we had to have the jury believing that it all started when Sarah Gregory abandoned her tractor trailer. This clip goes on to establish what we wanted the jury to believe, and that was that but for her losing control and but for her blocking the lanes of I-40, there is no hazard that confronts our client, and our client goes on down the road, gets to Amarillo, and is able to watch his grandson play in the finals. And you agree that in the face of you creating this hazard, people were at risk for dying out there on the road as a direct result of the hazard you created. you agree with that? The weather created, yes. But you're the one that lost control. Correct. All right. So now we're facing a situation in which we're... There's a hazard that you created where other people can die and lose their life, right? Correct. 
and your decision was to abandon your vehicle and let them, the other motorists, fend for themselves with respect to the hazard you created. Sir. So at this point in the deposition, it is gone on. This is day two. And you can tell the witness is getting tired and she is simply agreeing to make this thing go away. At the time that this driver was deposed, there were six lawyers in the lawsuit and the deposition of her went about two and a half days. And this is towards the end. Another thing I want you to notice is that these plaintiff's lawyers that are examining these witnesses are very polite, they're articulate, and they are very precise in their language. You do not have to be a flamethrower of a lawyer to get what it is you want. And in fact, my experience has been that the more polite and the more professional and the more calm a lawyer is, generally the better that a jury will receive them. The four-way flashers became a very big deal in this case because our client impacted the trailer about a foot to the right of the flashers. And our accident reconstruction expert said that the flashers, if they were of illuminated, would have been visible from a long way off. But we know by Sarah Gregory's testimony that she did not illuminate the flashers. And so this was put up on a screen, huge in the courtroom, and the safety director for Prime had to admit that a hard to see vehicle can result in an accident causing death or personal injury. He had to admit that another vehicle could run into you if you do not set your flashers and follow the placement of emergency signals for the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations that are minimum standards, that are minimum. And he had to admit that his driver did not even do the minimum. So this is her co-driver, Aaron Ellison. He was no longer working with the company at the time that this case went to trial or was deposed. We tracked him down in Arizona and he gave his deposition. And he was sort of comic relief during trial and I think you'll see why. But listen to what he says about what you should do in inclement weather. Do you remember the kind of weather that you started to encounter on your trip starting in Sky City and heading east? Um, I, I want to say it may have been just cold, but uh, I do know that it was icy, like chunks of ice later on, because you know, it's kind of hard to sleep when you're stuck doing this constantly, you know. Um, I remember feeling some of that. Uh, and what is a commercial driver, commercial motor vehicle operator supposed to do when they start hitting chunks of ice? Um, slow down. Same thing you would on any other, you know, inclement weather. Uh, obviously, you don't want your cruise control on. It's not going to do you any good. <laughs> um, if anything, you want to be more slow because you're hitting what would be, you know, big potholes if it, you know, if it wasn't there. And if you're hitting chunks, these what you call chunks of ice, that significantly increases the likelihood that the roadway is going to be icy. Is that fair? Yeah. When you were training at Prime, did you learn that one of the indicators of icy roadways is things like ice accumulating on the windshield or on your rearview mirrors? And he said yes. So a couple of things about this testimony. Now you've got her co-driver saying there were chunks of ice out there when Sarah Gregory said there was no ice. You've got her co-driver, who was a B1 driver as well, who knows that when it's slippery, you shouldn't have on your cruise control or go fast and you should slow down. And Sarah Gregory, who said there's no precipitation before the wreck, 
has to deal with the fact that in the hours before the wreck, there is a message sent that says the windshield wipers are freezing up. So the jury is now going to start to question Sarah Gregory's veracity as to the weather and her actions that day. So remember we talked earlier about Sarah Gregory being a novice or an inexperienced driver. Any of you who have had to be a corporate representative know that you live and die by the testimony given by your driver. And here's what Steve Fields had to say about that. Listen with me. The testimony will be that one or more drivers pulled off on the side of the road. I think if those drivers did that, they made a wise choice. So did Sarah Gregory not make a wise choice? I don't know if she had the level of experience. Maybe one of those drivers had experienced black ice in the past. I don't, I don't know what was going through Sarah's mind. So you read in Sarah's deposition, do you not, that she said she wasn't an experienced driver, correct? I think she agreed to the word novice, maybe. That was my terminology. She asked for it. And she told me that, quote, had she been an experienced driver, she would have done things differently. Remember reading that? Uh, not specifically, but I'm sure it's there. So now, this safety representative says a more trained driver would have reacted differently. And black ice was the defense that was put forth by Prime and was essentially that was black ice on the freeway that nobody could have seen, and it was an act of God, and therefore nobody should be held liable. And so that is where you hear Steve Fields start talking about black ice. Lesson number four, the standard of care. As I mentioned earlier, every chance a plaintiff's lawyer gets, they are going to try to make your truck driver and your company be held to a higher standard of care. They want the jury thinking that the driver of a four-wheeler can do things that it is excused, but your driver, if they do the same thing, it is inexcusable. Now, the problem in Texas is that it's all the same standard of care. The jury is simply asked, did the negligence, if any, of those below approximately cause the accident in question? Name of the plaintiff, name of the truck driver. A plaintiff's lawyer is going to want that jury to think that your driver is held to a higher standard of care. And this is what it looks like when a driver is confronted with those questions. So when we use the word negligence, can you and I have an agreement that we use this legal definition? Yes. Okay. Do you agree that a violation of the standard of care would be negligence by a commercial driver? Yes. You also agree that it would be negligent basically not to warn upcoming drivers and others that you had disabled and caused a hazard, correct? Correct. So on this particular day, you agree that at least in part your actions were negligent as the jury submission that I just read to you, correct? Correct. Do you feel like at least that you bear some fault, or basically some responsibility, in not doing some of the things that you previously identified that were breaching the standard of care? Yes. yes. And to that extent, while you may not have been the sole cause, you do agree that you were a proximate cause and contributed in some part to this sequence and series of these accidents and these events that happened, correct? Is that a yes? yes. Now, I want to... I, I will think, I think we're talking over each other. I would like a clean answer to that question. Sure. Could you read back the question, please? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll slow down. I'm sorry. Sorry, Jim. So question, and to that extent, while you may not have been the sole cause, you do agree that you were a proximate cause and contributed in some part to the sequence and series of these accidents and these events that happened. True. True. So now, if I'm defending the trucking company, I've got a driver that is admitted that she is at least in part responsible because she has breached this standard of care. This standard of care as to what a professional driver should have done after becoming disabled on the freeway. And here is another line of questioning where she's asked about her responsibility. So when we use the word negligence, can you and I have it? We'll go to this one. Here we go, where she talks about what she did. After the crash, you were in the vehicle, uh, but before you exited the vehicle, uh, did you turn it off or did you leave it? It was still on. Did you leave it on the entire time? Yes. Why? I was in a panic. All right. 
What about your lights? My lights were on. Do you have um, some flashers that you can activate, emergency flashers on the back of that vehicle? Yes. And did you ever do that? No. Do you agree in your condition knowing, do you agree that in light of where your trailer was, from your perspective, partially on the roadway, that would have been a prudent thing to do. Yes. And you agree the standard of care would, would, would have required you to do that. Yes. And you agree that you deviated from the standard of care in failing to do so. Yes. You departed from your responsibility to other motorists on the highway. Yes. And all of the other folks on the highway, including my clients, had the right to expect that you would follow the standard of care in that regard. Yes. <clears throat> They deserved better from you than they got on that subject. Yes. If you'll notice, most of the questions that are asked of this witness are leading questions. They're yes or no answers. And it's for another day, but there are ways to work with drivers so that you don't get caught in that trap. These next two slides are really important because I think that this is where trucking companies are very, very vulnerable to this argument of higher standard of care and breach of a standard of care. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulation said that every driver like Sarah Gregory should be instructed and comply with the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations. Then it goes on to say, and this is the one that everybody on the call who works with trucking companies needs to be aware. It says that every motor carrier, its officers, agents, representatives, and employers responsible for managing, maintaining, operating, or driving commercial motor vehicles, or hiring, or supervising, or training, or assigning, or dispatching drivers, shall be instructed in and comply with the federal regs. I think that covers everybody that works at a trucking company. And the federal regulations say that you shall do this and you shall comply. Not should comply, not hope to comply, shall comply. And so when Steve Fields is confronted with this, he has to admit that no triangles was a violation of not only the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulation, but it was also a violation of Prime's policies. He had to admit that. Lesson number five. Don't assume the police are correct. This is the lead DPS trooper, Trooper Mosley. This was his first commercial motor vehicle fatality. It was his first fatality on ice. And remember, this accident scene had six different tractor trailers. Trooper Mosley says that the prime tractor wasn't even involved in the accident. His police report said the prime tractor was not even involved and he was not going to budge on his opinions. He just wasn't going to do it. Let's see how that ends up working for him. All right. And my question is simply this. Although you might have some initial sense of things that would lead you to certain evidence, is it a fair statement to say? that an important principle of accident investigation is that you would not form your final opinions until you looked at all the evidence. Yes. We can agree about that. Yes. That's a fair and important principle of accident investigation. Yes, it is. All right. And if one formed an opinion without looking at the evidence or disregarded evidence merely to support an opinion that one started with, that would be improper. True? It would be. And it would make the opinion suspect, true? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And it would make the opinion unreliable, true? I would agree with that. So now the trooper has had the rope wrapped around him. And he's agreed to these accident reconstruction principles. 
now the trooper gets a little bit chippy. Now the trooper did not, again, testify at trial. We had the testimony we needed from him and the defense didn't call him as an expert. Let's listen to what the trooper has to say when the vice starts to squeeze in a little bit. Please, I think please the clarify jury is for me. entitled to know why you decided to check some vehicles for paint transfer that were right there and some vehicles that you didn't. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury why you did that? Why, why, did, why did I decide to pay, check for paint transfer on the vehicles that were right there? Because they were right there. Well, and the other trucks and the other vehicles that were that were around the area, why did I not check them for paint transfer? Yeah. I did not check them for paint transfer because I did not think they were involved in the crash. Well, I understand, but wouldn't you want to? I mean, one of the principles of accident investigation is to rule out involvement in a crash. That's just as important as ruling in, true? It is, and the way I ruled that out is by looking at the scene, at the total scene, based on where these other vehicles had come to final rest, based on where the dead people were laying in the road, based on where the Prius was, based on where the other uh, van was and all that. There was trucks and other cars that were sitting around out there that, in my opinion, as the accident investigator, had nothing to do with that crash scene. I know, but you reached that opinion without checking, sir. I did. I did reach that opinion without checking. And if you now learned that there was paint transfer, for example, on that prime truck, that would cause you concern. Uh, I don't know if I can agree with that, no, because I don't think the prime truck was even involved. I know you don't think that, sir, but my question is a little bit different. Yeah, I'm getting real aggravated with the way you're asking me questions. I apologize. So if, if you want me to answer your questions the best way I can, we need to tone it down or not. I am. I'm trying to be polite with you. Okay. And I want to be professional and respectful. Let me ask it this way. If you learned that there was blue paint transfer on the prime vehicle, would that cause you any concern about your team? No. Why not? Because I do not believe that the prime truck was involved in the crash. But one of the ways, sir, as I understand it, that you determined which vehicles were involved in the crash was paint transfer. Did I get that right or wrong? You got that right. And so if you learn that there was paint transfer, right, just like you did with the other vehicles that caused you to believe those were in the crash, if you found there was paint transfer on the prime vehicle, I'm confused as to why you wouldn't believe that they were involved in the crash. Well, I guess knowing now, three years, four years later, that there was, I guess it would cause me some concern. And that's what at the time. When I looked at the prime ink truck, I didn't see any transfer. Fair enough. And and that's completely fair. And I'm okay with that 100%, okay? Mm -hmm. You didn't you didn't check paint transfer on the prime vehicle while you were out there cuz you reached in a preliminary opinion in your mind that it was not involved. Fair? Yes. Okay. But if you learned today that there was paint transfer on that prime vehicle, that would cause you to reevaluate your original opinions. Is that fair, sir? So the jury, when we visited with them after this verdict, did not believe the trooper. Had they believed the trooper, they would have said the prime vehicle was not involved. And his demeanor during his deposition, I believe, did not help the defense at all. Here again is him trying to explain why he didn't inspect the prime tractor. Did you do a full inspection all the way around that vehicle? No, sir, I did not. All right. Did you measure the distance of the final resting place of the prime tractor and trailer to the Prius or the Chevy van? No, so I did not because, in my opinion, the prime tractor and trailer wasn't involved in the crash. Again, that's a preliminary opinion that you formed without doing paint transfer, true? True. Without doing a walk around and doing a full inspection of the vehicle, true? True. And therefore, you just decided not to do it because your preliminary opinion was he wasn't involved. Fair? Sure. Lesson number six. 
money spent on the defense of the case will pay off in multiple ways. And this is what I saw from the plaintiff's side. We spent four days preparing our clients for their depositions. And remember, by the time they were deposed, we were, gosh, three years after the fact. We started preparing two weeks before trial. We had group meetings with all the clients and individual meetings. My job at trial was to put Alma Perales on the stand and get her direct testimony in front of the jury. Alma was the lady that lost her mother and lost her husband. I spent about 40 hours with her, drafting her direct examination and meeting with her. She was on the stand with my questions about an hour and two minutes. So 40 hours of preparation time for about an hour and two minutes. And what we ended up doing was simply going through pictures of her life and her family's life and having her tell the jury what the pictures said and the story that it told. Assume that every lawsuit you're involved in will be discovered and analyzed. When I was on this case, I was amazed at how fast the plaintiff's bar was and good they were in sharing information on trucking companies and experts. Let's assume you're a trucking company safety person and you give a deposition in a case on December the 6th, and then on December the 13th, you are giving a deposition in another case that on an accident that happened in another state. Assume that the plaintiff's lawyer taking your deposition on the 13th has your testimony from seven days earlier. We did it against the defendant's expert. Tim Dollar spent five full days preparing to depose this truck driver. Five full days. We used technology to help sell the narrative to the jury, technology that wasn't cheap, but I think got the message across. Our accident reconstruction firm spent about 600 hours, and the bill for our reconstructionist was about $200,000 which was about the same as Prime's accident reconstructionist. We had to hire a meteorologist to prove that there was ice on the ground because Sarah Gregory said there was not. We had to have a life care planner because Mr. Vasquez had to have his home refitted and have extra medical equipment because of his amputation. We had to hire a forensic economist to talk about the earning capacity of Mr. Perales, he was a school administrator and probably had another 20 years to work. And we had to hire an expert on trucking industry standards. We did two separate focus groups on this case, two days to prepare for each of them. Both of them were videotaped. We tested themes and anticipated defenses. In both of the focus groups, I presented the defense perspective on what I thought their argument would be, which ended up being what their argument was at trial. And it resulted in some strategic changes to how we put on the case. After the second focus group, six lawyers sat around a conference table crafting the message, six lawyers. And we came up with this message. Sarah Gregory shut down the freeway and she shut down options. And we wanted this message because it put the focus on Sarah Gregory and not P&O who rear-ended our clients. And we knew, not only from the verdict, but also from talking to jurors afterwards, that they understood this because two jurors told us, when she shut down the freeway, your clients didn't have anything to do. There's nothing they could do. Here's what some of the trial graphics look like. This was Belinda Vazquez, and we showed the juries what emergency services did, what injuries she had, the date and time of death, and the treatments and procedures that she received. Here's another trial graphic showing how she was the life of the family or the center of the family, how she was a mom and a grandmother, and all of the other things that we wanted a jury to think about her. So here are my takeaways before I stop talking. First, don't get hung with your own rope. Be careful what you have in writing. Your case rises and falls with your driver. Do not, do not, do not think that it's okay for your lawyer to meet with your driver 30 minutes before their deposition. I believe that's a recipe for disaster. Your driver should be at trial because we have to have a story when we defend these cases. We have to have a story. 
Even if our story is, our driver made a mistake and she should not have done those things, but we are a good company and we trained her up and she knew better. We have to have a story. Anticipate that the plaintiff's lawyers are going to try to make our drivers be held to a higher standard of care. Don't go blindly with what law enforcement says either way. For you or against you, don't think that they got it right. Hundreds of thousands of dollars spent defending a case can save millions of dollars on a verdict. Starting day one with hiring the experts you need and tapping into the collective wisdom and experience of your lawyers. I appreciate you all letting me share this time with you and I'm gonna turn it over now. Thank you very much, Mike. That was awesome. I'm going to talk shortly about how to manage critical crash situations and kind of reiterate some of the points that Mike and Jack made. I know it's a little repetitive, but these really need to be repeated over and over. One of the main reasons we're talking today is I was involved in a couple of critical crash situations that our clients had this past summer and they missed pretty much every one of the six points that Mike made. And I know we've done these before, but we it's something that until you experience a situation like this, you don't really understand. So first and foremost, when we're planning for these situations, remember it's not always gonna be your driver's fault. And even when it's not your driver's fault, you still have to defend because you do. You know, plaintiff attorneys, they're out to make money and you just have to go up and down the interstate to see all the ads. So, you know, that higher level of care may mean your guy could have done something different. So get folks involved, remember that, and, and really be empathetic to your drivers. Regularly review your procedures and policies to make sure operations are following them. What we're really saying here is, if, you're, if you say there's a two-day orientation, it's got to be two days. This is what you cover. Put it in there. One of the issues with that $100 million case that Jack brought up was there were multiple trainings that that driver signed off on that he admitted in his depositions he never did. On the flip side, we don't want to have dispatchers saying, I know you really can't get this done, but please get this done. So we need to make sure everybody knows what they're supposed to do, and they're continually doing it. The resources you need to use, attorneys, reconstructionists, your insurance carrier, who at the bro insurance broker, who at help the contact, identify that ahead of time. Make sure everybody has those phone numbers. Relationships should be pre-existing. You should know these folks. We don't have to be like going golfing with them, but at least enough where if we had a cup of coffee, it wouldn't be a first meeting. We would be asking how their kids are doing. The escalation process, within your organization needs to be understood from your driver to your dispatcher to everyone else involved. We don't wanna have somebody sitting on this for an hour saying, I've got a lot of trucks to dispatch, I'll get back with you. And again, as I said, everyone needs to know who to contact. When I talk about, when I used to do driver meetings in orientation about handling crashes, I always started with this, communicate, communicate, communicate. People can't help you if they don't know what occurred. And I would say, and I still say, your dispatcher, your manager, your executive may talk to that driver once, he may talk to that driver 15 times while on the scene. You can't help him if you don't know what's going on. And the other folks in your organization above, whoever is kind of that, uh, that fulcrum, that middle person, can't help him if they don't know what's going on. So please, please, please make sure everyone knows who to contact and that they forward it within the organization. On the flip side, we'll get to it in a couple slides, don't start forwarding information to everybody and anybody. Have that chain of command set. You know, these people need to know what's going on so they can give that expert advice. You know, one of the things that with any crash that makes it incredibly challenging is within three to four hours generally, and in severe situations within eight hours, there is nothing left with the exception of skid marks, gouge marks, and maybe a little bit of trash on the side of the road from any 
truck crash, from almost any truck crash. So, you know, we need to know what's going on. We need to get people out to the scene, even the most remote scene. So for internal stakeholders, your driver needs to be trained on what to do. As Mike was talking about, putting out the triangles, putting on the four ways, you can't remind your drivers enough about that, but also who to contact, how to get a hold of them, what to do. The driver's supervisor needs to know who to contact, how to have empathy for that driver, to focus on what needs to be done and not sort of fluff it off. What may seem minor is major. I remember, again, I'm full of stories, when I was involved, when I was working for an insurance carrier talking to a client about a truck crash 10 or 11 years ago, and they said, I said, why didn't you send anybody out to the scene? Our driver said it wasn't our fault. Well, that's a good idea, and as Mike was talking about, if the state police don't always know who's at fault, how can we expect our drivers to always know? So it's important that they escalate and really think things, through, think things through. Your safety or risk manager, if you have one, who do they contact? Do they have the president's phone number in their Rolodex or in their, or in their phone in this day and age? You know, your finance and human resource managers, what needs to be done right away, and how do we get that, you know, that group together, that war room, to really get things moving forward? And your executive management, you know, your ownership or your president of your organization, there's a lot riding on these crashes. I mean, again, when you're looking at a hundred, 110, $260 million verdicts, this could be the end of an organization. It needs to be handled and thought about right away. And I have you remember how to use the phone. One of the biggest challenges I've seen in the last year is people emailing back and forth or texting. Remember, this is all discoverable. There are things that are written down that may not really be directed where you're admitting guilt, but that are incredibly insensitive and are discoverable. Like, hey, did we repower that load or did we get that stuff delivered to the client? You know, when you have two dead kids, that's not what a jury wants to hear. Pick up the phone sometimes. Talk to people. Don't write it down. And again, educate your supervisors on what needs to be done in terms of what they should be writing and emailing and what they should be picking up the phone and calling. External partners. You got to get that insurance carrier involved immediately. They have a lot riding on this. Obviously, it's money, it's reputation, it's you know, all of those and more. You need to know their protocols. What is it? How do they do it? Are they going to manage the process or do you need to be a key person involved with that? Not all insurance companies do things the same way. Some are really good. Some are mediocre. One of the things we do at Hub when, we, when we're selecting a carrier for a trucking company is we put it out there. The cheapest company is not necessarily the best. If they don't have a good claims handling process, it costs you in the long run. Like Jack again said earlier, you pay for your claims eventually. So you really need to know what they do, how they do it, which vendors they would want you to use, and make have that list in case you can't get a hold of anybody on a, on a Saturday morning at 1 a.m. With Hub, we have folks, our, the people who are your producers, who are your primary contacts, the account executives, we have claims executives, people in risk services such as myself who get involved in these situations, have our, have our contact information. We don't always get our emails. Sometimes that phone call is really that important and we'll get somebody on there right away. It's two in the morning, I, when I'm in lullaby land, I may not check my email, but if somebody calls me, the ringer is there. So let somebody know who to contact and how to get a hold of them. And legal counsel, you know, there is the insurance carrier may appoint somebody. You may have an internal uh, attorney and you may want external advice. Get an attorney involved ASAP. That's how you create privilege as quickly as possible. You don't want documents flying around that, may, that, will, that are easily discoverable. They may be discoverable in the long run, but we don't want to give easy fodder to plaintiff's attorneys so that they're moving their case forward that much more quickly. Get a lawyer involved. He's going to have insights that other folks in your firm, in your organization, may not have. It's a huge, huge issue that's a little costly. But again, as Mike spent, 
Money spent now can save a lot later. Driver responsibilities. This is your primary person at the scene. He's the guy you want to be communicating with to let you know what's going on and to sort of, he's your rep de facto representative. Again, don't let it get worse. Secure the scene as Mike talked about. Triangles, flashers, pulling your vehicle off to the side of the road, calling 911, you know, aid the injured, show empathy. You know, it's not, you know, when we were listening to this case, I think one of the things that was incredibly striking is there didn't seem, these were not really sympathetic characters on the part of the, the trucking company. You know, we need to make sure that we get the right people involved right away. Again, and calling company personnel after you call those first responders, your drivers need to know, call 911 as soon as those triangles are out and then get company personnel on the phone. Know where it's at. Look at your GPS and if somebody says, I don't know where I'm at, get on that GPS, get on that ELD and say, where is my truck within a couple hundred feet? If your system can't do it, maybe it's time you looked at one that can. We wanna have our drivers collect information. Who are the other parties? What, what occurred? You know, so we can kind of figure things out later. Remember, for most, most drivers, for most people, something like this never happens. And for those unfortunate few, it happens once in their lifetime. They are in shock. They need a lot of coaching. They need to know what to do and how to do it. I'm not a big fan of having your drivers write everything down. Get simple information. Stick to what's objective. And step five, incredibly important, make no statements. That doesn't mean no comments. What it means is don't talk, don't talk to the press, don't talk to anybody except obviously law enforcement and company and insurance representatives to let them know what occurred. Be polite, be courteous, but don't make any statements and don't even to your, to anybody talk about what you think happened, only talk about what you know happened and really get somebody out to the scene to coach your driver through a difficult situation. After a crash occurs, company really has some important things they need to do. Make sure your driver gets proper medical treatment. That can include treatment for traumatic stress disorders. These are horrible situations and often are, you know, really career enders for a truck, for a truck driver. Make sure, obviously, as I've said before, I can't stress, get the insurance carrier and broker involved. You know, arrange for tow, vehicle repair, cargo handling. Mike was talking about downloading the ECM of the truck and other vehicles involved, make sure that when possible that your vehicle is towed to a dealership, to a third party to have that information downloaded. We wanna keep it objective and dis as discoverable as possible or as, so it's, it's not gonna be questioned. And it's important to have it done. Again, it doesn't take a lot to show what occurred. You know, I remember as we were watching Mike's presentation and we saw the speed off the ECM you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what the driver was doing. You know, when there's a critical crash and there's a possibility of criminal charges, provide support for that driver with regard to tickets, moving violations, possibly talk about providing defense for that driver. Put together a crash file. Have that information you want to have, including the logs, uh, ECM data, driver qualification file. We're gonna put all this together in a document for you to use. And we, we talk with our clients about this regularly. You know, have that stuff together as quickly as possible. Get that to your, to your defense firm so that they know what they're dealing with. And I think one of the things that gets overlooked, and again, Mike stressed this, and really it's important, what are you gonna do with your driver? It was, just, well, he was, it was his fault there was a crash, we're gonna fire him. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but you better let you better get your insurance carrier and your defense counsel involved before you make a final decision. Because again, as Mike talked about and really stressed, it's not a good situation when there's a bunch of lawyers at a table and no truck driver. That's an empty seat. And if he's not, if he or she is not working for you, there's a 50-50 chance whether they will even come to. A, a trial, even if they're named in a lawsuit. So 
So you want to have a plan what you're going to do, get your HR department, get these other folks involved, don't make rash decisions. And lastly, when it comes to the crash from, the, from a company standpoint, speak with a single voice. Have one representative, whether it's your director of safety, your CFO, president of the company owner, that person is the focus. He's going to deal with the press or an outside agency, as we often suggest for companies that can afford it. He, this is going to be the person who communicates with the outside world to let them know what's going on and is, tr is really the fulcrum that's bringing information in and sending information out so that there's no miscommunication and things aren't said by accident because that happens all the time. Again, talk, you know, in, in final here, calling in outside resources, engage that attorney. Get them involved as quickly as possible, and you may need more than one. You know, again, Mike was talking about cost. Scene response is a sophisticated science. It's not cheap, and it almost always pays dividends. Look at a reconstructionist. Get somebody out to the scene, whether it's a member of your organization, a third-party adjuster, uh, somebody you know remotely. Get them out there so that they can help coach the driver and find out what really happened. As I have here, now is not the time to go cheap. It really isn't. Know your limitations, as Dirty Harry said many times, and when to get other people involved who know a lot more than you in these situations. Lastly, and this is one thing we, we argue back and forth on, photographs and video. A picture is worth a thousand words, and a video we have here is worth at least twice that. I think, in general, a video is worth ten times that. Video is a great tool as to what happens, both to the positive and to the negative. If it's the crash is your fault, as Mike was talking about, alluding to anyway, if you know ahead of time what occurred and you think you re it's a problematic situation, it will change the strategy of how this is defended and, and the insurance carrier and the attorneys approach settlement. You know, we want to, this is an objective form of evidence. You know, it really is a very useful tool. I always suggest that drivers don't take pictures. We send a third party out to do it. And again, if you have any questions about uh, video services for trucks, please contact myself or your, or your hub representative, and we can kind of make some suggestions and talk through the pros and cons and how to use the systems. I want to thank you very much. I want to thank Mike and Jack for their awesome presentations. I want to thank you for participating. And now we're opening this up to questions. If we have any questions, we will answer them. So, first question, I think this is for Mike, is why should I spend money on an attorney even if my driver was clearly not at fault? Um, two things. One, this case scenario that I just went through ought to tell you why. In this case, Prime looked at the police report and it said that their driver wasn't involved. And if they had based their decision on that, they would have sent nobody to the scene. It doesn't matter whether or not your driver thinks they were at fault or is told that they were at fault. The question is, what could a jury do with that case? All you need to do is ask Warner Enterprises about their verdict down in Houston. Okay. Second question, this one's for Jack. What are the key pieces of information that trucking companies need to gather after a crash? I think, well, this is Mike. I'm going to jump in for Jack. Um, I think the most important thing to get is the ECM data, not only from your tractor, but also from the, the uh, four-wheeler involved, and get those driver's logs, because the F word in trucking is fatigue, and if a plaintiff's lawyer even gets a hint that your driver is over hours or approaching over hours, we need to know that within hours of the wreck, not three days before the trial. From the insurance side, it's instant contact with the carrier and a, an attorney. You have to preserve everything that you can and get it rolling in your direction as soon as possible. Thanks, Jack. And here I have a follow-up for you. Um, do insurance companies let trucking companies select their attorneys? Uh, some do, some don't. Uh, at the end of the day, 
Some of the carriers will allow you to use your own attorney in the event that they don't. Uh, I always feel it's still a good investment to get out, reach out, hire an attorney that is in your area that um, is good at what they do. You know, there is a, there's a history behind everything. There are specialists in Dallas and Houston that specialize in trucking. And if they're not on your vendors list or the vendors list of the carrier, then I would reach out and hire them anyways. And, and really big claims, this is Steve. I would suggest, or I've always suggested, getting an attorney for the company outside of the insurance carrier attorney, somebody to kind of serve as an armchair quarterback who understands trucking litigation and represents your interests and is kind of watching where things are going. Um, you know, Mike just brought up this Warner claim that was a huge claim, and I'm not exactly sure what went down because it wasn't exactly told except that it was $80 million. Um, but you want to make sure you have a third, uh, in situations where you're looking at dollars escalating, that you have a third party watching what's going on. I experienced this firsthand when I was a risk manager for a trucking company, and we had a six fatality crash. And... You know, you start watching what's happening, and our guys were very comp our attorneys were very competent, but we still got that third party, you know, out of Cleveland who knew the state, who knew really what to ask for, and was representing our interest and kind of watching and, and giving us peace of mind. I think that's huge. Uh, we have another question here: um, If the police impound the vehicle, how do you go about collecting the ECM information? Well, if it is your vehicle, you have the right to do it. And all you've got to do, if nothing else, is get an email or a phone call to a record yard saying, this is my tractor and I want the ECM. Now, if it is for the other party or potential plaintiff's vehicle, you're not going to get that without an authorization, but all you need to do is send a letter or an email or something to that carrier for the other party, putting them on notice not to spoliate that vehicle so that you can download the black box. And we have another question that's really a good one. You mentioned sending a representative to the scene. However, oftentimes the scene is too far away to get there before everything is cleaned up. Are there services that will go to the scene to document things, and would you recommend that? Well, I can tell you that, yes, there are independent adjusters can go out and gather very basic information. But if you need to get a scene documented, an accident reconstructionist is going to be the person to do it. And you just need to get them out there as soon as you learn of an incident. I got a call on Sunday, this past Sunday, at about noon for an incident that happened the Friday before at about 10 o'clock at night. That's 48 hours too late, which is a, an eternity, but we were still able to get somebody out there Monday morning. The golden rule is that's why they call it the first 48 hours. If you can get somebody out there within 48 hours, that's the best you can hope for. And I'll say, when I used to, again, when I was a risk manager, I would go home every night with my Custard and my Crawford adjusting book to know who to contact, and I had their 800 number. Um, if you can't get somebody out there, I'm a firm believer in using a third party. The best independent adjusters are local ones, not with the big, with the big organizations. But if you have a situation in Burlington, Vermont, and you're in Dallas, Texas, you may have to contact them. Um, but if it's down in Houston, you have somebody in Texas you work with, that's great. The most important thing to do in these situations is contact somebody. Check with your insurance carrier and your hub representative to see who they, who they have on their preferred vendor list. Some have Crawford. Some have Custard. There may be another company. I'm not... We're not saying just those two, but find out who they are so that if your insurance carrier doesn't get a hold of them right away, that you can. Again, this is money well spent on the front end. Um, when you have a driver who may be injured and may be at the hospital and there's a camera, you know, there's a microphone put in front of their face, we want somebody coaching him because he's thinking, this is five of my 15 minutes of fame. We don't want to go down that road. Oh, and one last thing about this that I, we haven't mentioned, and I, I apologize because I should have. Right away when a situation like this happens, educate your entire company. This is, including your driver, this is not to be discussed on social media. It's amazing how often you'll see crash pictures from some employee up on social media. 
for, oh my gosh, we had a crash. You should have seen the crash I was involved in tonight. Again, it's all discoverable and it looks terrible. So just some points, again, we can work with you about, with any of you on the call about getting that crash plan together, getting some documentation and educating your employees throughout the organization. I will see if we have any more questions. We have a follow up. Um, oh, we do have one more question. Would it give an upper hand if the other party does not have insurance, if it goes for a lawsuit or arbitration? In Texas, another party not having insurance is not admissible in trial. So from a legal perspective, I don't think it'll make any difference. And then the last question we have, and thank you for all these great questions, what information should the driver provide to the police at the act, at the crash scene? I think what I call the front page information, the facts, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Name, date of birth, company, where they're coming from, where they're going to. When you start talking about opinions or things like that, uh, I hope our drivers don't give that information up. Exactly. I, when I do a driver meeting, when I talk about this, stick with the sub, with the objective. Don't give the subjective. And I want to thank Jack and Mike very much for this really awesome present webinar. This is one of the best we've had uh, in 2019. We're looking forward to another great series. Thank you all for participating. And if you have any follow-up questions, please let Christine J Jacobs know. Thank you, and have a great day and a great holiday season.